uh, really excited about today. Pull your notes out, please, and grab a pen or something to write with. If you have a tablet, that'd be great as well. Uh, but uh, as he mentioned, we're starting a new series. Next week is Easter, but today we're starting this series called Nobody Here, Nobody Here. The tomb is empty. In three weeks, I'm going to take a sabbatical. If you were here the last couple of weeks, you got our newsletter, you know that I'll be taking a sabbatical through the summer, and uh, there won't be nobody here. No, there's going to be here. Pastor Kevin, Stephen, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal communicators. Pastor Kay, you're going to do a great job. You guys are going to be like, oh, don't bring the old guy back. Um, they're doing awesome. Uh, it, uh, 20 years ago, my wife and I and our three kids uh, were meeting with 19 adults and about 26 or 27 little kids running around and we were going to, we're, we're anticipating, we're so excited to open the doors of Church on the Ridge for the first time on Easter Sunday, 2004. And we're like, okay, is there anybody going to be here? You know, we had that feeling. There's nobody going to show up because there's not a, there wasn't a church here, and now there is, and the whole thing. But we wanted to do it right. So one of the people on our team said, let's do a practice um, gathering. So we'll act like there, you know, there's people here, but we'll have the greeters in place and the kids' ministry in place and the signs out and, and uh, you'll, you'll uh, teach just like you were if the room was full and the music people, the worship team, will do their worship stuff and like, just like the room is full. And, we'll get, and if there's any bugs, anything, you know, then, then when it, on Easter, we'll do it right. So, okay, well, we'll do it. So we get here and, you know, we're just scrambling. We're trying to get everything ready for Easter this big day and hoping that somebody would show up. And so on Palm Sunday, 2004, we do this practice service. So, you know, our greeters there with programs, pass them out to nobody and we've got signs out for nobody and we, I preached it. But all of a sudden, one of the guys, Pastor, a family's come through the door. What? We're not, nobody's here. <laughs> We're not here. He said, no, but there's a family. And so we went and met them and the whole thing. And they came in and said, well, Pastor's going to preach. There's no, you can sit and nobody's here. But, and, they, and they stayed. For the next 15 years, we ministered to that family, the sis. In fact, they were in your youth group. That's one of the people that you poured into and took the camp. And, and now they've got their families and kids and the, and the whole thing. And it was incredible. Um, and on Palm Sunday, there was nobody here, but then the next week, 20 years ago, next Sunday, we opened the doors, church on the ridge to the public, and uh, there were over 260-some people here on that Sunday. It, was, it blew us away. It's like, wow, crazy. Well, go back not 20 years, but 2,000 years, and the opposite took place. On Palm Sunday, everyone was there. Crowd showed up, man. Jerusalem was packed out. They're excited for Passover, but then they, they were also excited about this guy named Jesus, who's this king guy who's can do all kinds of stuff, and, and it's going to be amazing. And then, and then just a little bit, a few days later, getting ready for Easter, and then nobody's there. So it was opposite. And, and I, understand, I understand doubting. You know, is this Jesus guy real? I mean, come on, it's one thing to say that you're a good guy, but to claim you're God? Let me, let me ask you, write down what miracle, of all the miracles Jesus did, which one would you have to see in person to go, okay, no more doubt. I get, that guy is the guy. No more doubt. Which one of the miracles would you have to see? You know, he did a bunch of them. Uh, just, just, just think about that. Some of you aren't writing, but I can see the wheels are spinning. Uh, some of you who are in recovery going, oh, water in the wine. That's mine. That's, that's, that's the one. <laughs> Give me that one. I'm going to believe her. <laughs> uh, you know. Which one? Any, any, any miracle you got? Shout, shout one out. Lazarus. Lazarus. Lazarus coming from the dead. Yeah. Five thousand loaves and fishes, yes. Wait, there's twenty thousand people here, and he feeds them with a happy meal, chicken nuggets and some fries. Come on. What else? Leper. Yeah. Guy ostracized, cast away, and all of a sudden, the disease is gone. Whoa. Oh, how about walking on water? Like serious? Okay, I'm done. He's God, right? Here's what the Bible says happened. Meanwhile, and this is in John chapter 12, just before Palm Sunday, so this is like days before. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, 
but someone mentioned it, but because they also heard about Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Come on. This guy's dead. He's alive. For on a, uh, so the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Right? If you know the story, the chief priests are the ones that said, this guy's coming to be God, get rid of him, and now let's get rid of this guy he raised from the dead, which is kind of funny to me because like, if he raised him once, he'd probably do it again. Like, <laughs> Go ahead, kill him. I'm, I'm bring him back. Just, kill him. I'm bring, bring him back. Right? But uh, for on account of, many of the, for count of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Hey, I didn't, I didn't understand the water to wine thing. You know, that was a story. I didn't understand the feeding the five. But when Lazarus came back to life, Okay, I'm in. I'm putting my faith in him. I, I, I wonder, I wonder, you know, because you could, you could actually go around and talk to Lazarus, right? You live there in the area outside of Jerusalem. You just, hey, Lazarus. I wonder what the, some of the things that Lazarus would tell them. Oh, yeah. It was really dark when I started to die. It was really dark. Or maybe, maybe, oh, I saw the brightest, brightest light. You know, you hear some stories about people with near-death experiences, kind of thing. This is not near-death. This is dead, dead for three days, four days, excuse me. And uh, uh, he's dead. And, oh, it was bright. I was in heaven. And then, oh, what a whoop. They called me back. <laughs> Come on. You should have seen my house in heaven. You know, the mansions. I don't know. Or, or maybe, you know, when I heard my name, I knew that was my Savior, my King, my Lord. And I don't care if I was in heaven, I don't care if I was just in darkness, but when Jesus calls, I respond. You know, what, what are the things that, that uh, you know, changed, you know, what, what, what was going on there? But people got to talk to him. But then less than a week later, less than a week later, look at this, Mark 14, everyone deserted him and fled. Nobody there. Everyone ran away. Everyone fled. Didn't matter that they had talked to Lazarus and he told the stories. I, I'm not even sure if Lazarus wasn't one of those ones who also ran away. And, and, I, and I get it. Um, this was a big deal. They were, they were going to arrest these people, torture them, crucifixion kind of stuff. And like, I don't, I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I, sometimes I wonder, you know, we run away from things, oh, you know, I, I can't say anything. People make fun of me for going to church, you know, whatever. I, really? But okay. Uh, there, there are little things that cause nobody there. There are little things that cause nobody there. There are three distinct events in the Palm Sunday story I'm going to teach you this morning. You can read or you follow along in your Bible or see it on the, in your notes. About what caused nobody to be there. And they fled. Uh, number one, the cult, the command, and the cleanup. All right, number one, the cult. It's just a little donkey ask. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. 500 years before this event, a guy named Zechariah, hearing from God, God speaking, the Holy Spirit speaking to him, and he writes this down and says, guys, I'm going to predict something. God's showing me something here. And he says this, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughters of Jerusalem. See your king comes, righteous and having salvation. He's going to save people from death to life. And then look. See your king, uh, uh, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Whoa. So here's the story. Here's the, here's the historical account, Mark chapter 11. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem, Jesus did, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Untie the colt and bring it to me. And if anyone says to you, because you could hear the wheel spinning, uh, we're just not going to go steal this donkey, Jesus, uh, uh, if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside the, the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, why are you stealing my donkey? And when they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded them, they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches and, from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna. 
Hosanna. Hosanna is simply the Hebrew word for save us. Save us, God. Save us, God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Save us, save us, save us. Save us to the highest place. This also is a prophecy fulfilled that was written a thousand years before by King David in Psalm 118. It says, O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. That word, O Lord, save us. Hosanna. Hosanna, O Lord. Grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Same words. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is our God. He has made his light shine upon us with boughs in hand. And the people are waving their palm branches and their boughs and their fronds and all the stuff. Hosanna, with boughs in hand, join the festal pr pr procession. 500 years before, Zechariah, cult. 1,000 years before, David shows the picture. Zechariah is writing this down. He's going, there's going to be a donkey. A colt. That wild. A donkey to carry the Savior. There was a divine destiny attached to a donkey. <coughs> God had a purpose for an animal. I, I believe that Jesus has purpose for everything that he creates. Jesus has purpose for animals. God used a donkey to help people encounter him. A week ago, God used animals to encounter him here at Church on the Ridge. If you were here at our dog show, let me show you some pictures from our dog show. These are on our, online, our Facebook page and other places, but uh, it was wild. We had, we had hoped, you know, someone said, that's a dumb idea, Pastor, and they go, you're right, it is a dumb idea, but we're going to try it anyway. If you don't try dumb ideas, you're not going to try anything, because you just got to give it a, we, we, our, our hope was, our goal was to get 200 people here through the doors of our church, and uh, Jeff told me last week that we had over 300 people come through. I know, I know, it's cool. We, we, had, we had hoped to have 30 dogs sign up for the show. We had over 40 dogs sign up, and about like 70 dogs wandering around that didn't show up. I think some snuck on the stage thinking they were cute, but, um, <clears throat> oh, that's Mr. Pickles there in the corner. He's adorable. Has he been adopted yet? He's on his way. We were this close. Oh, man. Uh, that's Mr. Pickles. And uh, these are, it's just one. Let's go to the next slide. This is incredible. Oh, there's the winner. Yeah, obviously it's not Molly. Molly won nothing. She got to hear to go home with your participation ribbon. Um, and, uh, and then this next slide. This is so cool. This is the community group that put this thing on. Uh, Allie in the burgundy there at the front. Uh, had this said, hey, I can do this. Let me do this. I want an amazing job. And, and she got her community group, and their community group is using animals, using dogs for people who don't ever go to church. They come and they go, wow. And people asking us questions. This is a church. Hey, we'll have to check this place out. God can use a donkey. He can use a dog. He can use animals. God uses his creation so that people can have an encounter with him. If God has a divine destiny for a donkey, what does that say about his children, you and me? There is a destiny attached to your life. In a verse we like to use a lot around here, Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are God's workmanship. Look at this, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared for us thousands of years. Eternity years. Another verse, Psalm 139, uh, 16 says this, God, your eyes saw me when I was formless. Before I ever even took any shape. Look, check this out. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Now, I don't know how this happens, but I can picture in heaven God going, oh, I got a book for Jerry. I'm day one. She's going to cry a lot. I'm going to go ahead and cry. Day two. And on March 31st, 2024, I got a day planned for her. God had a plan for that cult. How much more does he have a plan for his kids? And he says right here, I've written them down. Here, here's the million, million dollar question. If God has a plan for us, what keeps us from fulfilling that plan. 
Why do some people follow that plan and others go through life wondering, why was I born? What am I here for? What's, what's my purpose? Or, or worse, why are some people adamantly opposed to God's plan? Why is there so much evil in our world? Think about the horrible things that people do to one another. In fact, it's one of the major reasons why people doubt that there's a God. If God is writing their plan in the book, why are, well, you know, I don't want to serve a God like that. Most of you, if you've been in church for any length of time, know the verse Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah. I, you, you could probably quote it. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for you to be an evil son of a cuss. Plans for you to hurt people. Plans. For, and I'm writing them in your book. And I'm picking you to be the jerk. Jerk right there. You know I'm funning with you. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for a hope and a future. Plans to prosper you. Plans for good. The plans that God wrote in the book for you and me are good plans. Jeremiah wrote that. A few chapters later, Jeremiah 32, no one ever reads this because it's so ugly. Jeremiah writes, talking for God, they built high places for Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnon. Ben-Hinnon. It doesn't mean anything to you. It means the son of Hinnon. But there's a place just outside the walls of Jerusalem called the Valley of Ben-Hinnon. New Testament calls it the Valley of Gehenna. Greek, it's translated Gehenna. In English, not Greek, not Hebrew, it's translated hell. Have you ever heard of that place? The Valley of Hell. Because there in the Valley of Ben-Hinnon, the Valley of Gehenna, the Valley of Hell, it was a garbage dump. They would throw all the refuge from Jerusalem into that valley. And they would burn it, and that thing would burn all day long. And it's the place where it says, where the fire is not quenched and the worm dies not. The valley of Gehenna, the valley of ben Hinnon, hell. And there in the valley of ben Hinnon, you can see why it's a place of hell. You built high places there in that valley to sacrifice your sons and daughters to Molech, the god of fire. They would burn them in the garbage dump. Sacrifice to their god. Though I, God, never commanded it, nor did it enter my mind that mankind would do such detestable things. When he's writing his book, He's never even coming up with the thought of the evil that you and I have done. It doesn't even register. All I've planned for you is good. I've never planned a day of evil for you. Hell was never God's plan for anyone. What causes us to run away from God's plan and do it our way? Two things from this story. Number one, the, gold, the cult was tied up. The cult was tied up. We are tied up. A couple of weeks ago, we learned from our guest speakers that uh, we all have soul wounds. We have things, trauma, issues that have hurt us. People, people maybe, maybe not like those guys in, in, in Israel's day when they were sacrificing their sons and daughters into the flames, but we've got family of origin that a lot of, man, some of, some of, some of you went through hell. Let's be honest. Some of you had great parents. God bless you, man. I always, I always wanted to grow up in your home. Great parents. And they, they go, but you know what? There's still trauma. There's still hurt. There's still things that affect us. And those things that uh, our speakers talked about, Bab and Tom, they talked about how they tie us up. How they bind us. How they keep us from being who we were created to be because we've got all these wounds. And so we react out of those wounds. We hurt the people that we're supposed to love and love the people that hurt us. And it's just, we're, we're bound. Like that donkey tied to the door. Not being able to be used for anything. I'm tied up. I, all I can do is stand here. Twenty years ago, 
God saw church on the radio and said, I got a plan for church. For thousands of people who are tied up and bound, hurting and broken, and in desperate need to be set free. You disciples, you go untie that donkey. Untie it and bring it and then let it be used for the purpose it was planned for 500 years ago by this guy Zacharias called it out. Lazarus comes out of the grave. You know the story. Four days in the grave, they're afraid he's going to stink so bad because rigor is set in and the maggots and all the stuff. They get to, you know, and, and, and he calls him forth and, and here comes Lazarus and he's, he's all wrapped up in grave clothes the way they used to mummify him back then. And he comes kind of, kind of walking out like this, trying to do his thing. And he finally gets out and everybody's looking, whoa, now I believe, right? And everybody's going, and, and Jesus does this weird thing. He tells his disciples, he goes, guys, unwrap him from the grave clothes. Now, if I'm one of the disciples, I'm standing there going, Jesus, you just call them back to life. Just tell the grave clothes to drop. It, it's not going to be hard for you. You can do one, you can just, hey, just snap, do your thing, Jesus. Get the grave clothes off. And I, I stinks. You've been in there four days. Just do your miracle thing. But no. No. Jesus calls us to untie the grave clothes, which brings me to the second. The second point there is, in, in, oh, John 8, let's, let's use that verse real quick, don't go too quick. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. We're here to bring the truth to people so they can shout Hosanna to the Savior. We're here to reach every home in this region to help become fully devoted followers of Christ. But the second reason is number two, we run away from the ass. <laughs> we run away from the ass. In 1611, back a few years before we started the church, when I was a young man, King James said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the language and the people of my country, my island nation of England. So he commissioned to have the Bible translated from the Latin into English. And it was called the King James Version of the Bible. Some of you grew up with it, and you remember the King James Version. It's got a lot of these and thous and shalls and shalls nots and and and. The King James Version translate that verse in Zechariah like this. He is just in having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Jesus, you want me to go get that ass, untie it, and bring it to you? That's an asinine question task, Jesus. You don't, you don't go and steal other people's asses. Come on, Jesus. I, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And there's no body there to go get the ass, to do the ask. Nobody there to do the hands and feet of Jesus. To unwrap the grave clothes because he stinks, because it's Stupid. Jesus, do it yourself. Do a miracle if you want it done, Jesus. Oh, man, I wrote in my book, Bartholomew, one of my favorite followers. He's going to be the one to unwrap the grave clothes. Uh, he missed it. Bummer. Oh, you guys are going to be the ones to go get the donkey and we're going to ride on him. You know what will cause the end of Church on the Ridge? It won't be a scandal. It won't be, you know, something, something stupid we get our name in the paper for. And any time a church gets its name in the paper, it's not good. So, you know, at least here in the Pacific Northwest. We could change that, though, to something really awesome. And they couldn't, it, anyway. It's, it, you know what it's going to be? Nobody here to do the work of Jesus. I don't want to work with our recovery program, those people. Oh my goodness, two-year-olds, are you serious? Have you seen the two-year-olds of our church? They run around here like little hellions. They just, you know, they got snot coming out their nose and they rub up against you. No. Are you, seriously, youth? Pastor Kevin, you work with youth? Ah, junior high boys, they're the worst. Talk up, they smell worse than two-year-olds. And they, they, 
I'm not going to teach a Bible study. I know I've been in church a long time, and I can facilitate, but I'm not, I'm not going to host a community group. No, my, no, Robbie, my, you call, what do you call your little robot that does your house? We call ours Robbie. Pac-Man, yeah, yeah, Pac, we call ours Robbie. Robbie, and, you know, no, Robbie doesn't go on Monday nights, so forget it. I'm back in the house myself, forget that. Why would I help with a dog show? That's an asinine odd idea, Pastor. What a stupid thing to do. I'm not going to give my tithes and offerings to some church. I just want to come here and drink the coffee and just, yeah. oh, somebody serves the coffee? Well, I'm not going to do that either. <clears throat> How do we, you know, what, what's the, we have a membership. When's our membership class? Wednesday. 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 Oh, thank you. Ha, that's so, you guys are amazing. You know, you know if there was nobody up there, <laughs> I, I couldn't teach. Um, membership class, how do we do it? Because people like you say, this is my church. I, I, I'm gonna be somebody. I, I'll help take gray clothes off. I'll do something as dumb as finding a donkey and untying it. Let me ask you, what little ask have you been running from? Number two, wow, I gotta go. Second event in Palm uh, Sunday, the command. It's just a little grudge. The next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off, so he went over to see if he could find any figs, but there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again, and the disciples heard him say it. Jumped down the next day as the disciples walked past the fig tree. The next morning, they noticed that it was completely dried up, roots and all. Peter remembered that Jesus had said to the tree. Then Peter said, teacher, look, the tree that you put a curse on has dried up. Then Jesus told the disciples, have faith in God. If you have faith in God and don't doubt, you can tell this mountain to get up and jump into the sea, and it will. Everything you ask in prayer will be yours if you only have faith. Now, man, there's some awesome teaching that I don't have time to teach on today. But he, he, look at these last two verses. This is what I want you to see this morning. Whenever you stand to pray, you must forgive what others have done to you. Then your Father in heaven will forgive you of your sins. There's, a, there's a, a, a tide to the forgiveness thing. I'm like, well, I thought it was unconditional. Well, no, there's a condition to it. There is a condition to your forgiveness right here in God's word. Stand to pray. Stand means to stay. Stand does not mean to run away. To stand, to pray, and do what? Stay there and do what God commands you to do. What's this command? On your batteries for your pack. <laughs> yeah, they're done. Stand, not run away. Stand and forgive. No way. I won't for You don't know what they've done to me, Pastor. I know it's hard. I know it's tough. Let me give you some reasons for unforgiveness. Number one, I just won't do it. They hurt me too bad. Not going to do it. No, not that person. You don't know my brother-in-law. You don't know this coworker. You know what? Thank you so much. You don't, you don't, you don't know what they've done to me. I will not do it. Number two, I cannot do it. The pain is too deep. The hurt is too bad. I, it, is, it is down. You talk about a soul wound. That thing has wounded me so bad, I cannot do it. It's, 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 it's impossible. Number three, I, I do forgive. I do, I do. But, I, but you know, you, you, can't, you can't fault me for getting even. You know, I'm, I'm not going to wish them well. It's the little grudges that will cost us anything. It will cost us. I, I won't forgive. That's on you. I cannot forgive. What did Jesus just say? You can say to this mountain, jump and go into the sea and it will. You can do the impossible. Just a tiny bit of faith. You Just a tiny bit. Okay, God, I don't have much. It seems really hard. I've been hurt, but I'll take that little tiny bit of faith and I'll put it to practice. Why, why is the, the Bible written in, written in some of the letters in red? Anybody know? 
the words of Jesus. But why red? Why not purple? Why not green? Why not, you know? Red is life. Red is also the color of blood. Yeah. And when they said, you know what? We want to remind you of what Jesus did so that you could be forgiven. I want to remind you that he spilled his blood so that we could stand before God and say, Hosanna, I've been set free. I'm a new person in Christ, but I'm not going to forgive you. It's your wife I'm pointing at, Ben. I know she's not even looking at me. She's taking notes. Pay attention. I'm not forgiving. But Jesus has forgiven me. Oh, my goodness. What little grudge are you holding on to? Number three, the cleanup. It's just a little business I'm doing. Another play on words, a little busyness, a little business. Verse 15 in the Palm uh, Sunday story, when Jesus returned to Jerusalem, he went into the temple and began to throw out those who were buying and selling there. Buying and selling, doing business in the temple. He turned over the tables and those who were exchanging different kinds of money and he upset the benches and those who were selling doves and Jesus refused to allow anyone to carry goods through the temple courts. Then he taught the people saying, it is written in the scriptures, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you're changing God's house into a hideout for robbers or a den of thieves, if you remember it that way. And the leading priests and the teachers of the law heard all this and they were trying again to find a way to kill Jesus. But they were afraid of him. A little busyness, a little busyness, a little business, and we miss our time with God. So we plot to kill him, get him out of our life. Listen, I don't have time for you. Rather than love you and serve you, I'll tolerate you until the time is right. Jesus refused to allow anyone to carry goods through the temple courts. They were doing business when they could have been praying. Listen, nobody do business when it's prayer time. Nobody keep so busy you don't have time to pray. So much of time we, 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 we fall into this. And I don't know, I think it's been going on forever, but it's, it's so easy now because uh, we, don't, we don't carry these anymore. Hardly any of you carry a Bible, and I'm not blaming you for not carrying one, but you, you just don't do it. And, and, and when you reach, do you, do you start your devotion, do you do your devotion time, you do this, right? Right? Because you've got your Bible and, you know, 26 different translations on your phone. So you pick this thing up, and I do it. I'll start my, and I, oh, Pastor Kevin emailed me. I better email him back quick because it's important, and he's really important. I don't want to miss it. I don't him. Oh, look, and somebody texts me. I'll get, oh, hey, I want to see what Jerry put on Facebook because she's got a great Facebook page, and so i got to check that out. And oh, wow. Uh, and you know what happens? I just did a lot of business and a lot of busyness. And I did no prayer, I did no Bible, I did nothing. And Jesus is going, what are you doing? What are you doing? Look what he says about my body. Uh, no, don't look there. We miss the whole point of life, our connection with God. We miss the whole point of who we're supposed to be, our connection with God. Here's a, here's a story about a guy who was so busy. L listen to this. A police officer arrived at the scene of an accident before the, the dust had even settled. He found the wealthy young man had been thrown out of his Mercedes just before it plunged over a steep cliff and crashed into the rocks far below in a ball of flames. The young man was standing along the roadside at the top of the cliff weeping. He was bleeding profusely from a stump on of his shoulder of all that was left of his arm saying, my Mercedes, my Mercedes. And the police officer looks up and says, man, dude, you ought to be thankful you're alive. And just amazed. The officer looking at him. But my car had a $20,000 upgrade package on it. Staring down at the burning wreckage. And the policeman says, there are things more important than that stupid car. Come on, get back away from the cliff. We've got to get you to the hospital. Your arms have been torn off. You could bleed to death. The man, young man looked down at his stump for the first time and said, my Rolex, my Rolex. It wasn't there. It was down in the car. Some of you. It worked better first hour. I don't know. <laughs> the busyness of life, the business of life keeps us from the things that will bring us to God. First Corinthians 6, do, not, do you not know that your bodies are God's temple? The Holy Spirit lives in you. You're not your own. 
Remember the words in red, you've been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I get it. We've got to get the kids fed. We've got to get their homework done. You know, this, this is the thing. If you're a teacher, what's the deal with homework? I want them to do homework. I want them to come home, clean their room, mow the yard, get their chores done. How about uh, uh, applying that homework? Because my kids would like get an F. Homework. Anyway, I'm off track. Um, we got to get there. We got to get them fed. We got to get our homework done. We got to. We got to pay the bills. We got to go to work. We got to be honorable to our employers. All those things have to happen. But when's your time in the temple? I've told you this so many times. The first 14 minutes of your day will determine your destiny. Take the first 14 minutes. I've got a busy, busy day. I've got so many things. It's all of us spinning through your heads. But I'm going to take this time because I don't belong just to me. I belong to the Lord, and He lives in me. And His house, this house, ought to have some prayer in it someplace. I love the example that Jesus gives. I skipped this verse earlier. But did you notice that this wasn't technically Palm Sunday? It's the next day. He said, hey, you got three things, three things from Palm Sunday. This is not really Palm Sunday. This is the next day. So what's the deal, Pastor? Are you lying to us? I, I skipped verse 11. Can we go back to verse 11? Jesus entered Jerusalem, right? Comes in on donkey, everyone's shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And he goes into the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was what? Already late. He went out to Bethany with his followers. The sun was going down. A Jew will pray three times a day, morning, noon, and when the sun goes down. It's called the Ma'ariv. Ma'ariv. It simply means in the evening. And they do their Shema. And Jesus said, you know what? There's a lot of work for me to do in this temple. I could be busy here for a while because there's a lot of people selling stuff and I got to turn some things over and I got to do some, some business here. Oh, but I'm not going to miss my evening prayer to simply do business, even for God, even in the church. And he gets his way back to Bethany so he can spend his time. And the Ma'ariv was actually in the evening when the sun went down, but it was actually the first prayer of the Jewish day. Not the last prayer like we think of it. Because the Jewish day starts from sundown to sundown the next day. That's one day. Sometimes we get confused with the three days in the tomb and all that kind of stuff. So we don't understand how the Jewish system worked. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to start my day with the Father and the Ma'ariv, even though I got a lot of work to do. What's the little busyness that keeps you from being with Jesus? And I'm done. What's the busyness? What's the grudge that's keeping you from forgiveness? What's the little ask that's keeping you from your divine purpose? As I went through these questions myself, I got really depressed. I'm, I'm being serious, I got really depressed. I don't know why God would use me at all. Until, until I remembered this is Palm Sunday. And Jesus says, I'm in. This was planned for me before eternity began. It was written in the book. I'm going for it, Charlie. And I'm doing it for you because you're so busy and you forget and you hold grudges and you can do some stupid things that I never even dreamed of. But I love you. And I'm not going to stop on Palm Sunday. I'm going to go all the way to the cross. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It's one of the reasons why... Our leaders here said, Charlie, you need a sabbatical. You're, 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 you're busy all the time. And you're missing God. But we love you. And they're like Jesus. Was, they, they, they're doing this stuff. I was so proud of these guys looking at me and going, Charlie, we love you. I didn't give you a break. You're not condemned. And neither are you. This is some of the most famous words of Jesus. Are you worn out? Are you tired? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. 
get away with me and I'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Some of my favorite words in the whole Bible. I won't lay anything heavy on you, Charlie. Nothing ill-fitting. Keep company with me. Come on. Let's walk this out together. And you'll live free. Let's bow our heads and pray. <laughs> I gave my life to Christ. I made a decision to say, Jesus, you are God. I didn't see Lazarus raised from the dead. I didn't get to see any of those miracles, but he came into my life and he broke some of those chains and he's breaking them almost daily in my life. Some of those bounds and he's using people like the elders of our church, the leaders of our church to undo some of the wounds and the hurts in my life. And I am eternally grateful. And I will forever say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I made that decision. Maybe you're here this morning, you haven't made a decision yet to follow Christ. You've, you're still trying to maybe wonder, maybe if I see this miracle, maybe this, maybe there's some, still some doubt there. But today, something's pricking your heart and you're going, I need a purpose. I need to forgive this person that I've been holding on to. And I could really use some rest. It's a quiet time with God. Well, today's your day. If you're here this morning and you say, I, I need Jesus, I want you to just lift your hand. Just, yeah, everyone, no one's looking around, but and, uh, amen. Who else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. God bless you. Wow. Yeah, me too. Me too. Father, you see throughout this room, God, hands, God, of people just going, yes, Lord, I need you. I need what you promise. I, I, I need to live out the days that you've written in the book of good instead of the crap I'm going through. God, would you enter into my life like you did in Jerusalem that Palm Sunday? And I will declare you as king because I need saving, Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Come and save me, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, I love you. Let's stand together. If you need prayer this morning, the prayer team's over here. Let me know on your connection card. Um, let me know in your connection card if you, if you uh, need some help, if you want to join the membership class, become a member here at Church on the Ridge. We'd love to have you. Uh, have a great week. God bless you guys. Invite somebody to church. Let's make sure there's not nobody here. <laughs>